Hi everyone, it's Professor Primerton, and in this video we're going to talk about antiderivatives. In this chapter, we're going to use the rate of change, which is the derivative of an unknown function, to determine the properties of the function itself. So this is the process called anti-differentiation and is represented using an integral sign. We're also going to cover several applications involving business, economics, social sciences, and physical sciences. So in this first section of the chapter, we're going to develop anti-differentiation techniques for power functions, exponential functions, and reciprocal functions. And we're also going to talk about the indefinite integral for basic functions. We'll determine the constant of integration given an initial value problem, and also cover properties of indefinite integrals. So in this first video, we're going to talk about using the indefinite integral formulas and properties to find the family of antiderivatives for a function. So antiderivatives. Up until this point in the course, we've talked about derivatives quite often. We've talked about how to find the derivative of a product of functions, a quotient of functions. We talked about how to find the derivative of a composite function using the chain rule. We've used implicit differentiation. We talked about derivatives a lot. But now we're going to talk about how to reverse that operation. There are many operations in mathematics that are inverses of one another, like addition and subtraction, multiplication and division, and even powers and roots. But we also know how to find the derivatives of several different types of functions. So we're going to talk about the inverse operation of differentiation, and this is called anti-differentiation, which involves reconstruction of a function, capital F of x, from its derivative, lowercase f of x. And we'll be spending the next couple sections on this process. So example one, antiderivative of a function. So let's just get some practice of what it actually means to be an antiderivative of a function, lowercase f of x. So show lowercase f of x is an antiderivative of the function f prime of x equals two times x using the basic differentiation rules. So notice in the problem, they're not telling us what the function f of x is, but they're telling us the derivative is two times x. So number one, the function f of x is x squared. How do you show that this f of x is an antiderivative of this function f prime of x equals two x? You take the derivative of the antiderivative. f of x is x squared means the derivative would be the derivative of x squared, which is, we know is two x using the power rule. So we do get the derivative of f prime of x equals 2x. So that means this lowercase f of x is an antiderivative because that was the function before we took the derivative. Number two, f of x is equal to x squared plus three. So again, let's do the same thing. Let's take the derivative of this function f of x. So the derivative of f prime of x would be the derivative of x squared plus three. We know the derivative of x squared using the power rule is 2x. And we know the derivative of three, the derivative of a constant is zero. So you simplify and you do get 2x again. So f prime of x is 2x, that means f of x equals x squared plus 3 is an antiderivative. Number 3, f of x is equal to x squared subtract pi. So if you want to show that f of x is an antiderivative of f prime of x, take its derivative. So you take the derivative of this f of x equals x squared minus pi. The derivative of x squared is 2x using the power rule. And the derivative of pi, well pi is just a real number, it's a constant. So the derivative is 0. And so again, you simplify and you get 2x. So since the derivative is 2x, that means that f of x is an antiderivative. And then number four, f of x is equal to x squared plus 104,573. So again, if you want to show that this is a possible antiderivative of f prime of x, take its derivative and you should get f prime of x, which is 2x. So f prime of x is equal to the derivative of x squared plus 104,573. The derivative of x squared we know is 2x using the power rule. And 104,573, it's a huge constant, it's a huge real number, but the derivative is zero. So if you simplify, you get 2x. And so f prime of x is 2x. That means f of x is a possible antiderivative of f prime of x. So you might be wondering, what's the point of this last example? We had x squared in every single function, and we know the derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of a constant is zero. So the question is, what do you notice about the functions f of x in this previous example? What are the similarities between f of x, and what were the differences between f of x? Each of the functions have the same term x squared because we know that the derivative of x squared is 2x using the power rule. So if we want f prime of x to have 2x, then the function f of x and antiderivative must have the term x squared in it so that we can get the derivative of 2x. That was a similarity. But if you notice the differences between all four of those functions is that the constant could be zero, the constant was three, it was negative pi, and then it was also 104,573. It doesn't matter what the constant was because the derivative of a constant is zero. So each of the functions will have a constant term as well in the antiderivative. And the constant just represents any real number. So notice from this previous example, there are infinitely many functions that all have the same derivative. This is due to the idea that the derivative tells us information about the shape of the graph for a function, but does not actually tell us what the function is. 
So what that means is that we knew that the function was either increasing or decreasing, concave up or concave down, using the first and second derivatives. But we didn't have any other information about the function itself. We can shift the graph up or down, and the shape of the graph is not changed. So this means the slope of the tangent line at any point on the graph does not change when you move the graph up or down, and the shape of the graph does not change. So this leads to one of the more delicate definitions for antiderivatives, where the words an antiderivative and the antiderivative are very important. So let's take a look at the definition of antiderivatives. An antiderivative of a function, lowercase f of x, is a function, capital F of x, such that the derivative of an antiderivative, so capital F prime of x, is the original function f of x. So on the left side, you have the derivative of an antiderivative, and on the right side of the equation, you have the original function. So the function they're going to give us in the problem is the lowercase f of x. This is already a derivative. We want to find out what was the function before we took the derivative. And that function is capital F of x, and that's called an antiderivative. On the other hand, the antiderivative of a function f of x is a whole family of functions written in this form, capital F of x plus c, such that if you take the derivative of the family of antiderivatives, so capital F prime of x, you get the original function back, lowercase f of x. So on the left-hand side, you have the derivative of the entire family of antiderivatives, where the family of antiderivatives will be capital F of x plus a constant term. And on the right side of the equation, you have lowercase f of x. So again, lowercase f of x is the function they're going to give us in the problem. That is already a derivative. We want to find out what was the function before we took the derivative. And the family of antiderivatives is represented as capital F of x plus c where c is a constant number. So before we continue talking about antiderivatives, there's notation to talk about the family of antiderivatives of a function. So notation for the antiderivative, the antiderivative of lowercase f of x is written as using an indefinite integral symbol. So this symbol that's the elongated s is called the indefinite integral. The f of x is the function that you're given in the problem that is already a derivative, and that's called the integrand of the integral. And the dx tells us that the variable of integration is x. So this is very similar to when we took derivatives with respect to x. And the way that you would read this is the indefinite integral of f of x dx. This symbol, the elongated s, is called the integral sign. And we're going to see this quite often in this chapter when we talk about integration. The dx on the end must be included, and it refers to the variable of integration. The elongated s and the dx can be thought of as left and right parentheses. On the left side, you have the integral sign. On the right side, you have the dx. And between the two, you have f of x, and that's called the integrand. Just like we were talking about with differentiation, there were many different ways that we said take the derivative. We said differentiate. We said take the derivative. We said find the derivative. We also had differentiation. So there are many different ways you can say anti-differentiate. So anti-differentiate or integrate mean the same thing. Find the indefinite integral of a function. Or you can talk about this as anti-differentiation as the action of finding the antiderivative or integration. Now, before we do the next example, keep in mind that there are no small families in the world of antiderivatives. If lowercase f of x has one antiderivative, capital F of x, then lowercase f of x has an infinite number of antiderivatives, and each of them is of the form capital F of x plus c, where c represents an unknown real number. So example two, family of antiderivatives. Determine the family of antiderivatives for each of the following functions, then check your answer using differentiation, take the derivative, so that capital F prime of x is equal to lowercase f of x. So in each of these problems that we're going to do, the lowercase f of x that we're given, it's a derivative. We want to find out what was the original function, capital F of x. And then keep in mind, we can always check our answer using differentiation. So number one, lowercase f of x is equal to 3x squared. The function that we're given is already a derivative. We want to find out what was the original function, capital F of x. So what was the function before we took the derivative? Now think about this. If we have the derivative is 3x squared, what was the function before we took the derivative using the power rule? Well, using the power rule for differentiation, we knew that we took the power down and we subtracted 1 from the power. So it looks like we took 3 down from the exponent. So it looks like capital F of x could be x cubed. So now let's check our answer. If you take the derivative of capital F of x, that would be the derivative with respect to x of x cubed. Now we know that we use the power rule to take the derivative of x cubed, 
and the derivative would be take 3 down, make it a coefficient, and you subtract 1 from the power, and that would make it 3 minus 1, or just x squared. So you get 3x squared after you take the derivative, which was the original function. That means that our antiderivative is correct. So the family of antiderivatives would be capital F of x equals x cubed must be part of the antiderivative because we want to have the derivative of x cubed to get 3x squared, and we can tack on a constant because the derivative of a constant is always 0. So capital F of x is equal to x cubed plus c, where c is a constant, and this is called a family of antiderivatives of lowercase f of x. Let's take a look at number 2. Lowercase f of x is equal to x cubed plus 4x. So again, this function that we're given, it's already a derivative. We've already taken the derivative of some function to get x cubed plus 4x. What was the function before we took the derivative? Because this would be an antiderivative. Let's try out this function. Capital F of x is equal to, so now let's think about this. We took the derivative of some function to get x cubed using the power rule. So let's try 1 fourth x to the 3 plus 1 power. We're adding 1 to the exponent because we know with the power rule, with derivatives, we subtract 1. So it looks like antiderivatives, we might want to add 1 to the exponent. And this 1 fourth will become clear in a second. The second term, we would keep the 4 just like we would with derivatives. Now let's think about this. This x term, what does the function need to be so that its derivative is just x? Well, we know that we need to add 1 to the exponent because the power rule subtracts 1 from the exponent when we take the derivative. So let's add 1 to the exponent and get 2, and this 1 half will become clear in a second. So after you simplify, you'll have 1 fourth x to the fourth power plus 4 times 1 half gives you 2 times x squared. So now let's take the derivative of this capital F of x. So capital F prime of x is the derivative, so d dx of 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 2x squared. So the reason why we had 1 fourth and 1 half as the coefficients for the antiderivative is this. What's the derivative of x to the fourth? The derivative of x to the fourth, we know that we take 4 and we bring it down and make it a coefficient. So 1 fourth times 4 is 1. And that was the coefficient of the original function. The coefficient was 1. So we need this 1 fourth out in front to cancel out the 4 that we take down using the power rule when we take the derivative. So 1 fourth x to the fourth, the derivative will be just x cubed. And now the derivative of 2x squared. So again, let's use the power rule to take the derivative. The 2 would come down, so it would be 2 times 2. That gives you 4. And then we subtract 1 from the power. So we just get 4 times x. And so this function is lowercase f of x, which was the original function. So that means capital F of x is an antiderivative. Capital F of x is equal to 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 2x squared. Now, if you want the entire family of antiderivatives, you need to add the plus c. So capital F of x is equal to 1 fourth x to the fourth power plus 2x squared plus c, where c is a constant. This is the family of antiderivatives for this lowercase f of x. Number three, f of x is equal to e to the x. So this time, the function that we're given is an exponential function with base e, because the variable is in the exponent. So this function is already a derivative. We want to find out what was the function before we took the derivative. What was the derivative of e to the x? It's e to the x. So what will be the antiderivative of e to the x? It's also e to the x. So capital F of x looks like it might be e to the x power because the derivative of capital F of x is the derivative of e to the x, and we know the derivative of e to the x is itself. So an antiderivative of lowercase f of x is capital F of x equals e to the x. And now the whole family of antiderivatives would be capital F of x equals e to the x plus c, where c is a constant. So now number four, f of x is equal to four times e to the x, subtract two x. Again, this is a derivative of some function that we need to find. So find out what was the function before we took the derivative, and this is called an antiderivative. So capital F of x could be four times e to the x, because the four will stay as a coefficient. We know that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and so an antiderivative will have e to the x in it. Minus two times x, Let's think about this. What was the function that we took the derivative of to get 2x? Let's keep 2 as a coefficient, and let's try the same thing that we did in the previous examples. We want to add 1 to the exponent because the power rule subtracts 1 from the exponent when we take derivatives. And so we also have to have the 1 half here to compensate because we want to be able to add 1 to the exponent. So now simplify the capital F of x. You have 4 times e to the x. That stays the same. Minus 2 times a half is negative 1, so you get negative 1x squared. Let's see if this capital F of x is truly an antiderivative. Capital F prime of x would be the derivative of what we think is the antiderivative. 
4 times e to the x minus x squared. So the derivative of the first term, derivative of 4 e to the x, 4 stays because it's a coefficient. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, so the first term is 4 e to the x. That's good. It matches up. Now the derivative of x squared. The derivative of x squared we know is 2x, and keep the sign between the terms. So we do get the second term as well. So you get the original function f of x back. That means capital F of x is an antiderivative for this lowercase f of x, because its derivative is the function f of x. So capital F of x is equal to 4 times e to the x minus 2x plus c, where c is a constant. That would represent the family of antiderivatives of this function lowercase f of x. So number 5, f of x is equal to 1 divided by x minus 6. So again, this is a function that is a derivative of some function we're trying to find. The function that we're trying to find is capital f of x, and that is an antiderivative. So what was the function that we took the derivative of to get 1 divided by x? It was a natural logarithm function. So capital f of x must have natural log of x in it. And now what was the function that we took the derivative of to get 6? It had to be 6 times x because the derivative of x is just 1. So minus 6 times x. So let's see if this antiderivative is actually correct. Take the derivative of the antiderivative, so d dx of natural log of x subtract 6x. The derivative of natural log of x is 1 divided by x. And the derivative of 6x is just 6, and keep the sign between the two terms. So 1 divided by x subtract 6, that was the original function, lowercase f of x. So that means our function, capital F of x, was an antiderivative. So capital F of x equals natural log of x, Subtract 6x. Now, if you want the entire family of antiderivatives, add the constant c. Number 6. This time, the function lowercase f of x is equal to 3 times x to the 1 third power. Subtract 5x. Again, this is a derivative already. Let's find out what was the function before we took the derivative. So, capital F of x is equal to 3 is a coefficient. Let's keep it. And now we have x to the 1 third. That is after we've taken the derivative already. So if we have already taken the derivative, we want to undo that. So let's use the power rule, but in reverse. That makes it 1 third plus 1 in the exponent. And now you have this 3 fourths as a coefficient. That will become clear in a moment. Keep the sign between the terms, so keep the minus sign. And now keep 5 as a coefficient. We've already talked about the antiderivative of just x. The antiderivative of just x is 1 half x squared. Because the 2 will come down and make it 1 half times 2 when we use the power rule. And that will just make it 1. So now if you simplify, you have 3 times 3 fourths, that is 9 fourths, x to the 1 third plus 1, that is now 4 thirds power, subtract 5 times a half, that's negative 5 halves, x squared. So this is what we think the antiderivative is. It's 9 fourths x to the 4 thirds power, subtract 5 halves, x squared. If we take the derivative, we should get the original function back. Let's check. Capital F prime of x is the derivative of what we think is an antiderivative, 9 fourths x to the 4 thirds, subtract 5 halves x squared. Take the derivative of each term separately using the power rule and constant multiple rule. 9 fourths times the derivative of x to the 4 thirds. You take the power down using the power rule. So 9 fourths times 4 thirds x, and now subtract 1 from the power using the power rule. So you have x to the 1 third power after you subtract 1 from the exponent, minus 5 halves keep, and the derivative of x squared is 2x. So now let's keep simplifying. You have 9 fourths times 4 thirds, that's 36 divided by 12, x to the 1 third power, and then 5 halves times 2 is negative 5, so you have minus 5x. And 36 divided by 12 is 3, so you get 3x to the 1 third, subtract 5x, and if you go back to the original function, that matches. So capital F prime of x is equal to lowercase f of x. That means our capital F of x is an antiderivative of the function that we were given. So if you want the entire family of antiderivatives, you need to add on the plus c. So capital F of x is equal to 9 fourths x to the 4 thirds minus 5 halves x squared plus c, where c is a constant. Number 7. This time lowercase f of x is equal to x to the negative 4 power plus 1. So again, this is a derivative of some function that we're trying to find. So capital F of x, let's think about this just like we did in the last problem. We want to add 1 to the exponent so that we undo the power rule. But at the same time, if we take the derivative using the power rule, we know that this exponent, which will be negative 3, needs to come down. We want to be able to cancel that out because we want to get a 1 here, just 1 x to negative 4. So let's have 1 divided by negative 3 out front as a coefficient. x to the negative 4 plus 1 exponent. And what's the antiderivative of just 1? What is the function if we took the derivative of gives us 1? It has to be x because the derivative of x is 1, so plus x in the antiderivative. 
So now simplify. You have negative one-third out in front as a coefficient, x to the negative three power plus x. So now let's check our answer. Is this truly an antiderivative of this lowercase f of x? Take the derivative of capital F of x, so d dx of negative one-third x to negative three plus x. Now use the power rule and the sum rule to find out what is the derivative. So the derivative would be negative one-third, you keep as a coefficient. The derivative of x to negative three, you'd bring negative three down, and you get negative three x, and you subtract one from the exponent, so you get negative three x to negative four, and the derivative of x is just one. So now, why did you have negative one-third out in front as a coefficient? Because negative three times negative one-third gives you one x to negative four. So one x to negative four plus one, and that was the original function, lowercase f of x. So capital F of x would be negative one-third x to the negative three power plus x. And now if you want the entire family of antiderivatives, add on plus c, where c is a constant. Now let's try one more, number eight. Lowercase f of x is equal to six times the cube root of x squared, subtract three times the square root of x. Let's rewrite what lowercase f of x is because we know that radicals are fraction powers. So if f of x is six times the cube root of x squared, that can be rewritten as six times x to the two thirds power minus three times square root of x. We know that square root of x is really x to the one half power. So this becomes minus three x to the half. This function is already a derivative. What is the function that we took the derivative of to get lowercase f of x? So let's try this. So capital F of x is equal to, let's keep six as a coefficient. You want to add one to the exponent because we know that the power rule subtracts one from the exponent. So you have x to the two thirds plus one power. Now let's think about what the exponent becomes. You have two thirds plus one. The exponent becomes five thirds. So when we take the derivative using the power rule, we're going to have a five thirds come down to the front and make it a coefficient. How can we undo that? you want to multiply by three-fifths. Three-fifths is the reciprocal of five-thirds. So three-fifths times five-thirds will just give you one, and then six times one will give you the six that we want as a coefficient after we take the derivative. Keep the minus sign between the terms. Keep three as a coefficient. Now let's think about this in the same way as we just did with the other term. We have x to the one-half. We know that we want to add one to the exponent because the power rule, when we take the derivative, subtracts one from the exponent. So one-half plus one. That makes the exponent three halves or one and a half. So we want to undo bringing the exponent down using the power rule. So you need to have a two thirds, which is the reciprocal of three halves out in front as a coefficient. So now simplify, you have six times three fifths, that is 18 fifths, x to the five thirds power, subtract three times two thirds, that just gives you just two because the threes will cancel out, and then you'll have x to the three halves power. This is what we think an integer will look like. 18 fifths x to the 5 thirds subtract 2 x to the 3 halves. So there's only one way to check to see if this answer is actually correct. Take the derivative of the antiderivative. You should get the original function lowercase f of x back. So capital F prime of x would be the derivative of what we think the answer is. 18 fifths x to the 5 thirds subtract 2 x to the 3 halves. So now take the derivative using the power rule and constant multiple rule and also the difference rule. You have 18 fifths, that's a coefficient, so it stays. Now use the power rule to take the derivative of x to the 5 thirds. 5 thirds will come down and make it a coefficient. And then you subtract one from the exponent. So you have 18 fifths times 5 thirds. 5 thirds in the exponent subtract one gives you 2 thirds. So you have 18 fifths times 5 thirds times x to the 2 thirds. Subtract, keep the two as a coefficient. And now take the derivative of x to the 3 halves using the power rule again. 3 halves comes down to make it a coefficient. And then you keep x and subtract one from the exponent. 3 halves subtract 1 gives you 1 half. And so now let's simplify completely. You have 18 fifths times 5 thirds. The fives will cancel out and you have 18 thirds. X to the 2 thirds power minus 2 times 3 is 6 divided by 2 just gives you 3. And you have X to the 1 half. And then 18 divided by 3 is 6. So you have 6 X to the 2 thirds power subtract 3 X to the half. Let's compare this with the original function. We have 6 X to the 2 thirds minus 3 X to the half. That's identical to the derivative of capital F of X. So that means our antiderivative was correct. So capital F of X would be 18 fifths X to the 5 thirds minus 2 X to the 3 halves. But if we want the entire family of antiderivatives, we need to add on plus C, where C is a constant. So let's finish up this video talking about an example where we are asked to find what was the graph of the original function if we're given the graph of the derivative. So we want to sketch the graph of an antiderivative based on the graph of the derivative 
using the ideas that we talked about in the previous chapter, including increasing, decreasing, concave up, and concave down, which involve the sign of the first and second derivatives of the function. So example three, graph of the derivative. The graph below shows y equals f prime of x, the rate of change of f of x. Use information about the shape of the graph to provide a sketch of the graph of the original function y equals f of x. That satisfies the condition f of zero equals zero. So the graph that we're given isn't y equals f of x. We're given the graph of y equals f prime of x, and we're trying to find out what is the graph of the original function y equals f of x. So the first thing to notice about this graph are the critical numbers. Where the derivative is zero or undefined, those give you critical numbers. So f prime of one is zero because the y value is zero for this derivative at x equals one, and the y value is zero for this derivative at x equals three. So f prime of three is also zero. So x equals one and x equals three are critical numbers for the function f of x. That means when we sketch the graph of f of x, the slope of the tangent line is zero at x equals one, and the slope of the tangent line is zero at x equals three. Now remember from the previous chapter, if we knew that the derivative was a positive number, that meant the original function was increasing. And on the other hand, if the derivative was a negative number at x, then the function was decreasing. If the second derivative was positive, that meant the original function was concave up. And if f double prime of x is negative number, then that meant that the function f of x is concave down. So let's look at the graph again. Notice that this function is above the x-axis between x equals zero and x equals one. So that means the sign of the derivative, so f prime of x is positive on the interval zero to one, and it's also above the x-axis from three to infinity. So that means the function f prime of x is positive on the interval three to infinity. If the derivative is a positive number, that meant that the function f of x is increasing. So that means f of x is increasing on the interval zero to one and also three to infinity because the derivative is above the x-axis or positive on those intervals. Also notice between x equals one and x equals three, the graph is below the x-axis. That means the derivative sign is a negative number between x equals one and x equals three. So f prime of x is a negative number on the interval one to three. That means that the original function f of x is decreasing because the derivative is a negative number. So let's use the idea of the graph again. This is the graph of the derivative. If the derivative is decreasing, that means the second derivative is a negative number. And if the derivative is increasing, the second derivative is a positive number. So this graph is decreasing from x equals zero to x equals two. And then the graph is increasing from two to infinity. So if f prime is decreasing, that means the derivative of that function, so the second derivative is a negative number from zero to two. So if the second derivative is a negative number, that means the original function is concave down. So the original function is concave down from zero to two. On the other hand, in the graph, the function was increasing from x equals two to infinity. So f prime of x is increasing from two to infinity. That means that f double prime is a positive number. So the second derivative is a positive number on the same interval, two to infinity. And that means that the original function is concave up from two to infinity. So let's summarize all this information about increase and decreasing concave up and concave down that we found from the first and second derivatives. The graph of f of x must be increasing and concave down on the interval zero to one. And then it's decreasing and concave down from one to two. It's decreasing and concave up from two to three. And then it must be increasing and concave up from three to infinity. So this is one possible sketch for the graph of f of x. We know that we need to start at this point zero comma zero because in the problem they told us f of zero equals zero. So the original function is starting at this point. So the graph is increasing until you get to x equals one and it looks like it's concave down because it's bending down. Then the graph changes from increasing to decreasing to x equals one. So the graph starts to decrease and it's still bending down until you get to x equals two. At x equals two, the graph is still decreasing, but now it's bending up. So between two and three, the graph is concave up and also decreasing. And then at x equals three, the graph changes from decreasing to increasing and the graph is still concave up. So the graph will look like this. So again, this is just one possible sketch for the graph of f of x. We don't know how high the graph goes at x equals one. So this is one possible graph where the graph goes up to one comma 1.2. We don't know how far the graph goes down at x equals three. So this is where the graph goes down to three comma zero and then goes back up where it starts increasing after x equals three. So this is a good place to stop our video. Now we talked about antiderivatives. If you have any questions about any examples in this video, please let me know.
Or if you have any questions while we work on homework for this section, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about applications of antiderivatives.